Fiscal year 2025 budget request for the IRS is $12.3 billion. Under what authority did the uh, IRS create the direct file system? Under the... Uh under uh, Section 7803 of, of the code, which requires uh, the commissioner and the IRS to administer the tax code in a way that serves taxpayers. If you come to us, you haven't paid your taxes, uh, guess what? We'll save you $1,000, $10,000, 50% of what you owe, et cetera, et cetera. That seems to me a great uh, a disincentive for people to pay their taxes. Are you concerned about those advertisements? I am concerned about those advertisements that you've got a top 10 list or something where it's like, we're going after A, B, C, and D because they're at the yeah. top of the list. Or we absolutely are, are, do. In fact, we have a top 1600 list. We've created uh, separate uh, working groups just to look at equity issues in tax administration. There's probably 90% of that is under 400,000 range. It's going to raise taxes. Mr. Commissioner, you were appointed by Donald Trump. Is that accurate? No. Pardon? No, no, I was not appointed by Donald Trump. I was appointed by President Biden. I got some misinformation. I'd like to welcome IRS Commissioner Werfel. This is the first time you've appeared before the subcommittee, and we look forward to discussing the IRS's fiscal year 2025 budget submission. This is also my first hearing as chairman of the subcommittee, and I'm looking forward to conducting uh, this oversight with the agencies under the subcommittee's jurisdiction whose mission impacts the everyday lives of hardworking Americans in my district and across the nation. Fiscal year 2025 budget request for the IRS is $12.3 billion. This is equal uh, to this current fiscal year. However, the IRS is requesting an additional $24 billion in mandatory funds to rebuild an army of IRS agents and carry out a direct file system that Congress did not authorize, among other enforcement priorities. Uh, Commissioner Werfel, the Inflation Reduction Act required the IRS to study the feasibility of creating a free e-filing tool for taxpayers to file their federal tax returns. The IRS completed the study in May 2023 and shortly thereafter created a pilot called Direct File, rolling it out in 12 states for those making less than $75,000 a year. The IRA mandated that the IRS study the feasibility of creating a free e-filing system. Under what authority did the uh, IRS create the direct file system? Uh, Congressman, I have two answers to that. First, uh, the small-scale pilot, we believe, is part of a study of whether a solution like that could be deployed nationally. So we wanted to not just study in the abstract. We wanted to actually engage in taxpayers, see if the prototype uh, could be built and could work. So part of the authority was the IRA requirement for a study. But the second authority is under, the, uh, under uh, Section 7803 of, of the code, which requires uh, the commissioner and the IRS to administer the tax code in a way that serves taxpayers, uh, meets the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, and we believe provides options for how they file. Under the laws that we have passed, uh, not being paid because of a lack of enforcement, which is both a direct loss and an indirect loss, a direct loss by the money we don't, and an indirect cost by uh, people who believe that they're not going to be checked anyway, so uh, they will uh, either go very close to the line or over the line. Congressman, we refer to that as the tax gap. It's the difference between the balance owed versus the balance paid, and we estimate it to be $687 billion a year. Here's a, a particular peeve I have and I want you to answer very quickly. I hear a lot of advertisements about uh, uh, on the radio, uh, some on TV, but mostly radio. If you come to us, you haven't paid your taxes, uh, guess what? We'll save you $1,000, $10,000, 50% of what you owe, et cetera, et cetera. That seems to me a great uh, a disincentive for people to pay their taxes. Are you concerned about those advertisements? I am concerned about those advertisements. Many of them are, uh, are uh, exploiting the complexity of the tax system and stress over taxes to, uh, to uh, victimize these individuals, and here's why. Uh, we have a variety of tools uh, that are very accessible for you to uh, either create an installment agreement or do an offer and compromise. We've designed them so that you shouldn't need help uh, they're very fluid to be able to get. And then you don't have to pay or give any financial risk to anyone who's claiming that they can get the IRS debt to go away. 
The reality is that we have programs in place. Uh, they're, they, they're very accessible. We're working on making them more accessible. And those that believe they have to work with someone in order to take advantage of these programs are giving something away. Help me understand the, uh, the difference between the enacted 24 versus the request in 25. Yeah, there are uh, choices that, that we need to make in terms of how we uh, maximize the effect of the discretionary request we have of, of $12.3 billion. Uh, we can also uh, provide uh, supplemental resources to, uh, to the taxpayer advocate uh, using uh, Inflation Reduction Act dollars to help close gaps. Any... Uh, Anything that you see in the 25 budget, uh, we are using Inflation Reduction yeah. Act to try to meet the demand. We don't always get all the way there. Uh, so we will work with the taxpayer advocate to help them manage demand. I mean, the, typically the better job we do with service, the less their phone rings. Uh, and so we can try to uh, reduce some of the demand by improving our customer service our ability to resolve taxpayer issues, and we'll also work with the taxpayer advocate to make sure that they are accessing other non-discretionary resources to make sure that especially hardship cases get addressed. And I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not going to pick on Optima necessarily, although their marketing's pretty good because that's the one I remember. Uh, but I too am, am concerned, and I've voiced this concern in this subcommittee before, that when you are driving down the road listening to a sports broadcast and you hear somebody come on and says, hey, if you owe the IRS, you're in good luck. Call us, and and we're gonna we're gonna give you all this relief. And and I just scratch my head, thinking, wait a minute, I I, I don't owe the IRS because I paid my taxes, uh, and so why should somebody else get off the hook? So I've always had a little bit of concern about that. Um, and and then the last thing, and this would just be for a quick response. You know, in recent years, we've seen a lot of indications of of identity theft stolen numbers, those kinds of things, people stealing and, and filing false claims and what have you. Uh, in your modernization effort, ha has that tamped down somewhat real quickly? Because I'm out of time. Yes, it has. We are doing a, a more effective job year over year in avoiding identity theft situations. Where we have work to do is once you've been victimized, the line is too long to get help from the IRS, and that's something we're focused on fixing. If more funding is cut from your budget, what would that mean? Well, what it'll mean... What are the consequences? The consequences is we will not be able to meet uh, the demand that taxpayers present. Uh, we won't. People will uh, call the IRS and not get through. That'll happen to more people. People will show up at our walk-in centers. Uh, they'll find long lines and not be able uh, to get in. And... We will, have, we will be limited in our ability to hold people accountable that aren't playing by the rules. In whatever context is appropriate, the technology advances have affected what it costs us to operate the company. How? H have we gotten any efficiencies and cost reductions in operating the, the company from the technology? Or Absolutely have. Yeah, we absolutely have seen efficiency. Every time we move a form from paper to digital, we've seen a lot more digital upload of documents. We're up to the point now where 94% of Americans can send stuff to us electronically rather than have to use paper. The reduction of paper reduces costs. The, the issue is that the tax system grows at a faster rate than we can drive efficiency. Some members have referred to with specific numbers, corporations. X number of corporations pay whatever, X number. C can you tell me what, if anything, you're doing? If it's finite, what are you doing to prioritize going and getting those 55 or whatever with your existing assets? I would assume that if that information's out there and they're not paying their fair share, that you've got a top 10 list or something where it's like, we're going after A, B, C, and D, because they're at the yeah. top of the list. Or we absolutely are, are, do. In fact, we have a top 1,600 list, 1,600 uh, millionaires and billionaires that, uh, that owe uh, back taxes. We have 125. So are, are they, t tell me. Yeah, we're collecting from them. They've heard from us. We're starting, we've, we've collected 500 million so far and more to go. We've sent letters to 125,000 wealthy individuals who haven't filed since 2017, and they're hearing from us. 
We've launched- Is that data available from you? Is that public information? Public information. Good. Also, uh, on the private companies, there is all the information about data got shared with Meta, which I don't think, you know, here we are, multiple bills to fight TikTok and, and other companies who are doing things with privacy and data, and we see this industry sharing data in a very disturbing way. We don't share data with anyone, do we? We don't. And, and this is what's interesting about, about taxpayers. They have different preferences, right? And, and different experiences. One of the notable things that we learned in the direct file pilot was more than 85% of taxpayers that use direct file said it increased their trust of the IRS. There are taxpayers out there who are not going to want to use direct file, who have a different uh, trust relationship with us, and they can use uh, commercial uh, software. The issue is taxpayer choice. Commissioner, do you believe the tax dollars of hardworking Americans should be given to foreign entities of concern or their U.S. subsidies? I we have a responsibility uh, at the IRS to, uh, to work to find the right outcome. Treasury ultimately has the final discretion on what a, a, a notice or a final rule will indicate. I know just based on the fact that we get a lot of public comment and a lot of differing opinions on whether how we construct a reg, well, what kind of outcomes it will have. I think it's a healthy dialogue to have. I think ultimately what our responsibility is at the IRS is to make sure that we're carrying out the laws dispassionately and on an evidence base, and that's what we try to do. So if I understand what you're saying is you feel that that's Treasury's responsibility to determine whether, um, you know, hardworking taxpayer dollars should be given to foreign entities of concern or their U.S. subsidiaries, I, I, not what, the IRS's. What I know is that with respect to the clean vehicle credit and other provisions uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act related to uh, energy, uh, the reg writing process has generated a, a multitude of different perspectives and opinions, a very healthy dialogue on the policy and operational tensions involved in the final reg. Ultimately, it's up to Treasury to, to calibrate all those tensions and come up with an outcome that best serves the intent of the law. And um, what is IRS doing to speed up the processing of the paper returns? Thank you, Congressman. Let me start with your first question, which is uh, underfunding uh, means two things. It means we don't have the right number of people. We're not right-sized. So that, therefore, uh, we don't have the scope and the reach that are necessary to, uh, to address uh, tax evasion where it's happening. And the second thing is we're not making the right investments in subject matter expertise and in analytics, including AI to make sure that we are unpacking the complexity. We are finding the right taxpayers uh, to audit and leaving the taxpayers that are playing by the rules alone. Um, it just, it degrades both our scale and our depth of knowledge, and it means that, uh, that more evasion will occur, uh, and that will create uncertainty in, in, in markets uh, and, uh, and be very challenging for those uh, companies and partnerships that are uh, playing by the rules and expects the IRS to hold people accountable to play by the rules. Um, you noted in a House Ways and Means er uh, hearing earlier this year, roughly 50% of IRS personnel are in the office at any given time. Um, so do you believe that this is still the case, um, that it's about half? And how are you tracking how many employees are currently in their offices um, to do those services, like you mentioned, pop-up uh, yeah. offices as well? Yeah, so there's a... a, a tens of thousands of IRS employees that, that, that are always on site. Uh, and and uh, these are people that are, for example, uh, managing the paper that's coming in and doing submission processing, but it's also our employees in our walk-in centers. There is no uh, remote work in any of our walk-in centers around the country. Um, we have, since the start of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, reopened or opened more than 50 walk-in centers around the country. Uh, they're virtually Are those being staffed every day. Though? Fully staffed every day. Here's the challenge um, that we see: uh, we move to an appointment schedule uh, during uh, the week, um, and we have tax more taxpayers coming uh, than we can handle in a lot of cases because everyone else has an appointment. So we started opening Saturday hours, and that's not by appointment. And sometimes, and, and a given walk-in center can serve about 300 people a day. Uh, on a Saturday without appointment, but sometimes four or 500 people show up. 
I want to make sure that you're focusing on tax cheats and that you're not focusing on the people that, you know, are doing everything that they can to pay their taxes. Yeah. When I arrived in the IRS in, in March of 23, uh, we began as a team to look at the audit rates, uh, in particular in low-income communities. Uh, there is a lot of inequity uh, that has existed in terms of how audits are uh, decided upon, and we are working to both acknowledge that inequity and change it. So and, and part of that um, involves uh, ensuring that you have a diverse um, workforce yes. um, so that they are, you know, have some cultural competency and income competency and that are not simply going after the lowest, um, the easy picking. Oh, absolutely. In fact, we have, uh, the, we have in, in response to these concerns on these equity concerns, have uh, worked with uh, uh, groups that are involved in these equity issues, external stakeholders, Treasury has committees, we have committees, we've created uh, separate uh, working groups just to look at equity issues in tax administration. Along, along the lines of Ms. Hinson had asked, uh, right now you are telling us basically that if we don't up the IRS budget that we will see a, a degradation in services. Um, but yet, just recently, uh, you made the goal of sending 50% workforce back to, back to work, basically, to stop teleworking. Um, to me and to most Americans who are footing the bill for this, this seems uh, pretty unacceptable. Um, I, I would urge you to get people back to work. My time's almost expired, so we'll have to get to that if questions for the record. But uh, uh, please work on the culture. Can you tell us what you're doing to work on the culture of the IRS? Yeah, we want the IRS to be uh, a, a, an amazing place for people to come and have impact. And the impact is to help people to reduce the stress they have in following their I'm taxes. I'm talking about the partisanship. It's also essential that there's no place for politics in the IRS. And we take numerous steps in our controls and our training, and we work with oversight entities like our inspector general to constantly evaluate moments where uh, where there's even the perception of politics in the IRS. And if there is, we work to correct it and make sure it never happens again. But I believe fundamentally across the IRS, there is a common understanding that if politics enters what we do, then we are not meeting our mission effectively. As you know, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which was passed in 2017, is set to expire at the end of 2025. With small businesses making up 99.4% of Alabama's businesses, and as a former business owner myself, what impact will this have to my constituents? The expir small businesses. The expiration of the of the TCJA is that your Correct. question? I, I have not done a, a, a kind of an economic assessment uh, of of the TCJA that falls more. Uh, with the Treasury Department. Um, in terms of whether the expiration of the TCGAA leads to administrative implications for small businesses, I'll have to assess that and get back to you. So you're, you're saying you don't know that if it's going to raise small businesses taxes or not. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm not prepared to provide an analysis of that. That is uh, something that uh, if I was to provide an analysis of it, I would have to do it in concert, in consultation with the Treasury Department, and I have not run that analysis. Well, keep in mind this administration is, quote, unquote, focused on not raising taxes on anyone making less than 400000 That is my understanding. And I'll promise you, out of this 99.4%, there's probably 90% of that is under 400000 range. It's going to raise taxes. The IRS proceeded with... 495,700 some odd examinations of individuals making less than $500,000. And I'd love to get more granular and uh, share the exact amount for the 400,000 mark uh, and less, but the data book doesn't include that level of uh, specific data. It's using 500,000 as the, uh, the 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 maximum in the in the range that I'm referring to, and that's compared to just twenty one thousand four hundred and fifty five examinations of taxpayers making more than five hundred thousand uh, dollars, resulting in just over three point six billion dollars in additional tax. Clearly, 
American families and individuals earning 400000 or less are experiencing the brunt of IRS enforcement actions. Uh, would you agree with that? I would not, Congressman. Uh, and your basis in disagreeing would be? Uh, because uh, what I've said uh, and what I'm committed to is that taxpayers who earn less than 400000 there's no change in their likelihood of being audited the day before the Inflation Reduction Act was passed versus the day after. However, if you're high income, if you earn more than 400000 and the reality is we're really laser-focused on much higher levels of income, for those individuals, the audit rate will increase. And I've announced uh, in my testimony to today the various cohorts, millionaires, billionaires, large corporations, complex partnerships, we intend to significantly ramp the audit rates uh, between now and 2026. Uh, the IRS Advisory Council public report that was published in November of 23 recommended that the reporting threshold for Form W2G be increased to $5,000. As you know, the threshold of $1,200 has been a static amount since 1977. In February 2024, I co-signed a letter with several of my appropriations colleagues on this issue. What consideration, uh, Commissioner, have you been given to update the W-2 G threshold in accordance with the recommendation of the IRS Advisory Committee? Yeah, I'm aware of this issue, Congressman. Uh, I think it's very valuable when we get input from the taxpaying community uh, and from our advisory council on when uh, thresholds may be out of date. Uh, as I've mentioned uh, throughout this hearing, uh, the determination uh, of, uh, of something like that is of, re of a regulatory nature, and therefore, uh, the, while they would consult with me, the decision rests with, uh, with Treasury, the Office of Tax Policy, in consultation with the Secretary. Uh, I know that this particular recommendation is under serious consideration, and uh, I can certainly provide you a more detailed update uh, following this hearing. First of all, uh, Mr. Commissioner, you were appointed by Donald Trump. Is that accurate? No. Pardon? No, I was not appointed by Donald Trump. I was appointed by President Biden. Okay, excuse me. Um, I got some misinformation. In any event, I'm going to make my point anyway. Mr. Reddick, uh, one of your predecessors, and you essentially have represented a nonpartisan, bipartisan uh, view of the revenue flow of the IRS and the impact on its ability to do the job that has been given to it by the Congress of the United States. Would that be an accurate statement? Yeah, I'm, uh, my, my predecessor, uh, uh, Commissioner Reddick, was a significant champion for the IRS workforce and for the dollars to get to, that we needed to get the job done. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, let me, unfortunately, Mr. Edwards left because I wanted to refer to his chart. And did you, you went up and looked uh, at yeah, it? Yeah, I but couldn't see what, it from What here, was the time preferred period for that chart? Did, did anybody recognize it? Did you see anybody? It, it, it talked about um, the start, uh, the close of audits in 2023, if I recall. And, uh, and the reality is that because of the, some audits take months, but many audits, especially complex, take years. Yeah. So the closeout date yeah. is very different than the inception date. Yeah. My point is, uh, I like that chart. Obviously, the ERC tax credit in your testimony, you say that uh, there is still a, a moratorium on processing those claims um, because of the fraud, the high amount of fraud with that. And I, I certainly appreciate the efforts there to combat that fraud. Um, but I am working with a lot of concerned business owners who have those claims pending, um, and those are refunds that they are rightfully owed. Some of them, um, some of these pending cases are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, so you can imagine when things are tight, it's the difference between what they were planning to do and grow their business and maybe add some jobs or uh, wait on those dollars. So uh, what is the agency's expected timeline, uh, Commissioner, to continue uh, processing those ERC claims? Well, for all, we're still processing claims received before September uh, 14th, uh, 2023, when the moratorium started. Um, since the moratorium, we've, we've processed more than $2 billion in claims. It's those that received after uh, September 14th that we are not uh, currently processing. Um, Do you have a timeline for when you might begin processing I those? I don't have a timeline. Uh, FY23, Treasury reported a staggering 33% of improper payments for the uh, earned income tax credit. So we were just talking about that. Yes. Uh, what are you doing to reduce those improper payments? 
Yeah, this is a really important point because it is that uh, that high improper payment rate that uh, that I believe led to the the large number of audits uh, in this program. Uh, we have to balance. There is a part of that error rate that is more concerning than another part of that error rate. So part of that error rate is direct fraud or a uh, or a. Um, a, a nefarious preparer who steals the EITC from the eligible applicant. Um, and part of that error rate is uh, the dependent child lived with the parent for uh, four months out of the year rather than six months out of the year, and that's the eligibility issue. In a constrained resource environment, we have to make choices. And Can you break that down for us maybe? That 33%, I mean 33%. Yeah, what, yes, we can get you more information on that. I would say that a large part of the error is kind of more of this technical error where it's the number of months you've lived with your dependent child. Where my commitment is, is on EITC improper payments, is to go after and correct the errors that are more nefarious. Again, I'd like to thank you for being here today and uh, the opportunity to have this uh, discourse with you. And uh, this meeting is now concluded.